All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think it's 11.15. Um, my name is James Labaki. I'm a, a product manager at uh, Red Hat, uh, working on something called Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure, which is a combination of technologies. It's OpenStack along with Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, which is our data center virtualization software, and a cloud management platform called CloudForms. Um, and recently, we just announced uh, this week uh, the new version of RHCI, our infrastructure offering, which now includes Red Hat Satellite, our systems management portfolio as well. But what I want to do today is talk about kind of uh, this, the significance of open cloud. So um, there's really four main shifts that we see taking place um, in IT architectures. There's a shift taking place in the infrastructure, a shift taking place in the platform, a shift taking place in business and middleware services, and then finally in IT operations management. And these are four areas that Red Hat really is, is focused on, um, uh, as you know, that we're focused on when these shifts are taking place. So real quick, from an infrastructure standpoint, the shift that's taking place, you guys are probably all aware of if you're here, right? This is, this is OpenStack's mission. Uh, it's basically transforming infrastructure, which is vertically scaling, using specialized storage and networking gear, and maybe virtualization, to a horizontally scaling infrastructure as a service platform like OpenStack. So this is, whether it's operating system with compute, software-defined networking, and software-defined storage, everything's defined, defined in storage. And rather than scaling up with expensive proprietary solutions with infrastructure, you're scaling out on commodity hardware. So the benefit is, is pretty obvious with this, right? While you're moving to OpenStack, the reason is, is you're moving away from specialized hardware to commodity, but then even one of the bigger benefits is that everything being software defined, it allows you to automate a lot more. So instead of having to you know, uh, work with someone or have some sort of process in place that's declarative, you could start to build out um, kind of imperative structures on the right-hand side with infrastructure and service. So that's the first shift taking place. Um, at the same time, beyond just the world of OpenStack, there's a shift taking place in the platform space. And so this is happening where people are moving from platforms, which you see on the left-hand side, to really platform as a service. So in the, in the traditional way of doing things, a platform was essentially you know, a collection of operating systems with application servers on top of them and then application code on them. So if I wanted to deploy a platform, I would call up my admin and then he would, the sysadmin would hand off to the application admin, he would install the application server, he would configure it maybe for clustering, all that would happen. It was very uh, bespoke, it was customized. It can only be done you know, by a certain individual. And there were ways to automate that um, with configuration management languages and things like that, but they were uh, expensive to maintain that, that configuration management and that lifecycle management tooling on the left. On the right, what's happening with application platform as a service is two things. Um, first, we are moving from a, a kind of imperative way of describing how you do things on the left-hand side to a declarative way on the right. So we have a pattern-based way that you could do things um, describe your application platform. So how, for example, I might declare how, I, how my middleware and my database server relate. And when I, de on deployment time, those two things can actually be merged together without an administrator being involved or without some configuration management language that's, or, or workflow process uh, taking place. And the second thing that's really leading the way here is containerization. So containers um, are being used in, in, in place of virtual machines. So that's driving up density. So what this is also doing is it's also allowing you to, just like infrastructure as a service, it's allowing, uh, since everything is defined in software, it's, it's allowing you to have programmatic access to this. So no longer do I have to call one API in my virtualization layer and then call another API for my config management layer and then call another you know, API for this. I'm calling the application platform as a service and, and asking it for an application server and it's giving it to me. Right? I get my application server, I get my source control repository, and as a developer, I don't have to worry about anything else. I pushed my source control repository, and my applications are updated. So that's, that's a big advantage. The, the third shift is really in the business and middleware services space. And so this kind of builds upon the application platform as a service. So where the application platform as a service is a developer asking for an application server, he might say, I want to build a Java app, and we give him you know, a, a Tomcat application server, customize the way he needs it, and it connects to his source control repository for automatic, uh, you know, updates. With XPaaS, um, X platform as a service, what we're really doing is we're taking 
um, higher level services like business process management, or, you know, as, as an example, or data virtualization, and we're moving those into the PaaS. So now instead of simply asking for Ruby or Python and getting those pieces, I'm asking for business process management, and I'm getting that. So I no longer have to just get an application server. I can actually get all this business value right out of the gate. So even more automation. That's the third, third area. Finally, the fourth area is around um, the transition from IT operations management tools to a cloud management platform. So you're probably all familiar with kind of the IT operations management tool set of old, old CMDBs and service management and chargeback and service desk capacity management. Those were typically all from other vendors, right? So separate vendors for each one of those uh, that reached out into your infrastructure to perform these tasks. And what's happening is people are moving to a cloud management platform. And the reason they're doing that is because a cloud management platform is able to iterate faster and plugs into your different infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service models um, and can keep up with their rate of change. So for example, when OpenStack iterates today, you know, how many of you have your, uh, your plugins from, from your you know, old change management systems that automatically plug into OpenStack very easily? You don't, right? It's very difficult to get that in place. Well, with a cloud management platform, there's not as much cruft around there and there's not as much legacy technology. So those cloud management platforms are iterating faster and they're able to provide features into those platforms much faster. So when you combine those four architectures, those shifts in architecture, the shift in infrastructure to infrastructure as a service, the shift in platform to platform as a service, and the shift in um, basically business, and pro business, um, uh, business services to XPaaS, and finally, with a cloud management platform, you really get the architecture for an open cloud. And so it starts with infrastructure as a service at the bottom, software defined, uh, horizontally scaling. It moves up into the application platform space where you can containerize your applications and also have predefined uh, tools for your developers to use. And then it moves all the way up into XPaaS where you can get entire sets of services there. And it's all pulled together with a cloud management platform. So this is what we see taking place today, people moving to this new architecture. But it's, it's not just about doing it in your own data center, and that's something, that's why an open cloud is so significant, because if you're not building this with all open source technologies, with a broad community, um, then what you're gonna end up with is you know, another silo in your organization. You're not solving the fundamental problem of how do you also move this out to be a hybrid cloud. So customers not only want this new architecture with all its efficiencies, but they want, two things. They want to be able to use public and third-party providers. So they want to be able to move out to broker their workloads onto whether it's a public infrastructure as a service cloud like Amazon EC2 or whether it's you know, moving out to a public PaaS. Um, they want to be able to uh, hosted PaaS such as uh, Red Hat's OpenShift hosted, hosted platform. They want to have choice there. They also want to be able to integrate into their existing systems. So they have these other IT operations management tool sets that they don't want to get rid of they want to actually plug their cloud management platform into there and let their, let their business take place. So what about the workloads? So the arc, you, know, you probably hear all week, like all the sessions here at OpenStack Summit, and when I look at the majority of them, it's all about how do you build your OpenStack cloud, right? And then you get it running. Nobody ever talks about the workloads, right? Like, isn't that kind of the whole point? Like, I think sometimes we, we sit there and we go, wow, we got it installed, and then we're like, Okay, what does it actually do, right? So if we don't actually focus on the workloads, it's, it's not good. So there's, there's all these benefits that this new architecture, whether it's infrastructure as a service or PaaS or XPaaS bring. And here's really four of them. One is you get much faster instantiation. So you, know, you, get it, you can get it on demand, whether it's a, um, the ability to, to just access it through a self-service portal faster, or whether it's spinning it up faster as a VM instance or even as a container with which launches in you know, a second or a sub-second launch time. Or whether it's, uh, another benefit is auto-scaling. So you can actually auto-scale these resources with you know, a perceived infinite elasticity. Um, the third is application recovery. So since these services, uh, whether it's the infrastructure as a service platform or the application platform as a service, provide APIs and kind of health monitoring, whether it's heat in OpenStack or it's you know, some of the tooling in OpenShift or it's Kubernetes uh, from, a, from a PaaS layer, there's tooling in there that allows you to begin to auto-scale your application. And, and also uh, auto recover it. And the fourth is uh, greater portability. You can, you can more easily move your workloads from on-premise systems to off-premise systems. So those are really the four areas um, that these new methods 
uh, pro provide you. So we're seeing, when, when we see customers adopt, this is a common theme that we see happening. When, when they're looking at their workloads and how do they move their workloads to this new model, uh, this is kind of the pattern we see taking place. So the first is really they go and they discover their patterns in their, in their existing environment. So what are my customers deploying? Right? So they go out and they say, what's in my data center today? And what are people requesting from me today? So they'll go and they'll look at, and this typically falls in four layers, as you see. So the, the first step is really they look and they say, okay, you know, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm automating the installation of my operating system. Right? And, and really, this takes a, from an operating system view up. The things around the, the, the actual machine or instance, those are you know, kind of assumed here, but th those are also important. The second is they look at how they configure that. So once I have an actual operating system running there, how do I configure it with packages, files, and services? What do I have to do to that system? The third is, how are they orchestrating this? So are they just phoning up a system administrator and asking them to make changes? Are they using a configuration management language like Chef or Puppet or Ansible? And then the fourth is, how do they define their application layout? So if I'm launching an application server, how do I relate that application server to its database, if it's an N-tier application, um, and so on and so forth? So that's the first thing. They discover all the patterns in their data center. And then what they do is they, realize, they start to realize which ones are being requested most. So they, they, might, they might figure out that 80% you know, of their developers are really just asking for a single, you know, single platform, right? Maybe it's uh, Tomcat or Ruby or Python that they're asking for. And so what will happen is they'll build a blueprint using workflow. So recognizing that their existing investment, you know, how, I, let me ask you this. How many of you guys are running VMware inside your organization today? Just curious. So a lot of you, right? So it's not expected that you would go and toss out all your VMware infrastructure today, right? Or all your physical infrastructure today, or you know, for that matter, maybe even your mainframe, right? So it's not, ex it's not expected that you would throw that out. So the first step is that they automate with workflow. And so what this means is they're using a, um, a, like a state machine-based automation engine uh, that goes out and does automation. So maybe this is my user comes in to the self-service catalog and requests their, their development stack. And my automation engine basically goes out and it'll, it will touch the F5 load balancer and create a, you know, create a new uh, IP address for it, add it to the pool. It'll go out to VMware, it'll call down to vCenter, it'll create the VM, right? You, you see, you've, you're probably all aware of this, right? So then, then it'll go down to the NetApp, it'll, it'll create a new volume on the NetApp for me, it'll connect it to the VM, it'll do all those things, right? So it's really the first step in data center automation. It reduces the manual processes, right? So and it, it also provides self-service to actually start to capture the users that are coming to the platform. So now I actually know what my users are consuming. And I'm doing this using my existing investments. I'm not throwing anything away. But finally, the, the, other, the problem with the workflow-based method is that it's expensive. When you update your, your F5 load balancer, your workflow breaks, right? When you update vCenter, your workflow breaks, right? API changes, right? There's no compatibility between those necessarily. And since the workflow has to touch all these different products from all these different vendors, it's very difficult to align that workflow and keep that automated, right? So what happens is they begin to add these cloud platform patterns to the blueprint. So a great example of this is Heat. How many of you guys are familiar with Heat or, or have used it? Okay. So, you know, Heat's great. So why would I go out and, uh, if, I, if I have Heat available, why would I go out and provision my instance and then provision my, um, provision my instance for web tier and then provision my database instance and then tie them together manually when I could leverage heat. And I know that from version to version, heat is going to remain you know, somewhat, somewhat compatible, right? <laughs> so in that way, I, I, get, oh, I get away from using workflows which will break between versions and I move to heat, which is a native capability of the platform, right? That's what I want to move to. I want to move away from workflow and towards the pattern. So this is really kind of the evolution from this data center automation to this cloud automation. And it doesn't have to be a rip and replace or a new silo. You can really build this into there. So you get native, native, native functionality. So things like auto scaling and heat or application recovery that you've seen maybe from some demonstrations this week, you can do that. And it really provides uh, greater resilience. All right, so what does this look like? So we talked about the traditional platforms before. So if on the left-hand side, this was your traditional platform, you know, maybe this is your, uh, you know, you got some, some NetApp or EMC storage, you know, your, your storage frame here. You've got VMs running on top of this specialized hardware with some operating systems on top. And database, Python, and web tier all tied together, right? And you've got that running 
When your developer comes in and he asks for that, and he says, I I'm starting a new development, a new development or a new application, maybe you're literally like procuring all this hardware in a rack and doing this. That's like the, the, the Stone Age way, and, and perhaps you know, people are still doing that, right? But you want to move on to this new platform over here, so how do you do that? Well, the first thing is you go out and you discover that pattern, right? You go and you say, how are they, how are they doing this? What, what network equipment are they using? What storage equipment are they using? How are they provisioning the operating system? How are they getting the application server on there? How are they doing all this? Once you figure that out, you basically create a blueprint in the cloud management platform that's using workflow. So you go out, you say, sorry about the, uh, the small type here. We'll get the resolution higher next time. So you go out, you create this blueprint that you then advertise out to your users. You say, if you want this stack this way on the right-hand side, maybe that's on VMware, maybe it's on Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, maybe it's on Hyper-V. If you want this stack where you can get your entire development environment, come to our self-service catalog, now select it, and we'll automate it. So when they do, the requests start coming in and you can automatically provision that. You're using workflow. So the automation engine goes out to your F5, it, it lights it up, goes out to the NetApp, does that, lights up the VM, talks to Puppet or Chef and makes all the magic happen, right? Um, I picked that up from the keynote yesterday, make the magic happen, right, if you guys were there. All right, so, so then the user's already coming to your catalog, so you've captured their usage. And now what you can do is you can start to optimize. So you can start to evolve to the, the cloud platform. So you can say, okay, now, you know, you probably want to notify your user. You don't want to do it without them knowing, right? <laughs> you, could, you could then send an, send an email out to them and say, hey, Mr. User, next time you guys request your new development platform, um, your database and Python layer, those are still going to be running in VMs. They're going to be running in a virtual machine, but they're going to be on OpenStack now, right? And so suddenly, you're moving them over to the lower cost platform, and maybe you're actually starting to define that with heat. And then finally, you start to move them over each layer by layer. So then you look at their application layer and you say, well, you're using a database in Python. Well, it's very easy for me to say, I can go into your platform as a service layer and I can create two Docker images for that. And I can create a Kubernetes template for that. And I can begin to construct that platform as a service description. So the benefit here is, one, I've moved them from expensive specialized hardware onto infrastructure as a service already. And everything is also software defined. So now, instead of making 12 API calls from, from my cloud management platform over to the F5 and the NetApp and the vCenter and Rev or Hyper-V and all this stuff and, and all those other pieces, I'm making one call to OpenStack and it could define that, you know, it's one API, right? With the platform as a service, I'm starting to get massive density. So on this slide, we're showing, you know, a couple of containers running on here. The reality is, is that we've, we've seen like, you know, a thousand applications running on a single operating system. Um, in our hosted platform as a service. So think massive density. So reduce the number of operating systems I have running. Yes, this is, this is Red Hat telling you to reduce the number of operating systems you have running, right? So now you have this containerized application running here, very efficient, and it's all software defined there as well. And not only that, but it's not a customized pattern. I know it's a known quantity. I've given that to my developer, I didn't say, Mr. Developer, please tell me how you want uh, Tomcat configured or Ruby configured or Python configured. I gave it to him and said, this is the Python you're gonna be using, and here it is, right? So another benefit. And then finally, I can move actually their, their, you know, their even higher level services into this uh, X platform as a service, right? So I could begin saying, not only are you gonna use Tomcat, but next time you want a mobile platform, I'm gonna give you the entire mobile platform, right? You're not gonna be using, you're not just gonna be getting an application server and then deciding that. So, Basically, you're, you're drawing a chalk, you're kind of snapping a chalk line on your infrastructure higher and higher to where more of it is standardized and less of it is controlled by the developer and the developer is only doing what they care about. All right. So, and by the way, every time you're doing this, you'll notice that this blueprint is basically updating. So I'm basically replacing inside my workflow. I'm taking huge sections of complex workflow out of my automation engine and I'm replacing them with those declarative languages in here. So whether that's heat, you know, instead of having a, you know, very complex workflow going out and touching all these pieces, I just replace that all with heat, right? Very simple. All right. So along with that, it's important to provide lifecycle management. So <coughs> part of this is being able to plug that into a development test and production uh, framework so that you can actually uh, move, when you're moving those applications, they have access to the content they need and you can actually uh, make sure that you have the right, the right content in the right place. And the other benefit of this is as you move to those cloud-based patterns, they become more portable. So 
whether it's being able to share it, whether having your vendor provide these things, such as you know, heat templates or uh, you know, puppet manifests and those things, or being able to author them yourself and have them in your own organizational repository, and then being able to deploy them onto your, on your infrastructure. So this is, this is all not possible without having kind of a basis of an open cloud, right? Where everything in your entire portfolio is open source. So this is where you're supposed to clap because I didn't mention any products until now. And this is a vendor-sponsored session. So, um, so this, is, this is essentially, if you were to map Red Hat's portfolio onto that open cloud, this is how it maps out. So the basis of our infrastructure as a service is, is OpenStack. It's Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform. So that and that's all built on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, horizontally scaling um, uh, you know, infrastructure. Above that, the application platform as a service that we were talking about is OpenShift. So that's built on Red Hat Enterprise Linux again and provides containerization for your applications along with standardization and automation for the developer experience. And then finally, up at the top, you have XPaaS, which is our offering to basically take all of our business and middleware portfolio and put them into standardized services that you can consume. And then on the right, this all gets tied together through, through CloudForm, so uh, you know, that provides all the IT operations management functions for those different layers. And inside the blueprint, that's basically what you're seeing here, is a lot of this is provided by something called Red Hat Satellite, which provides lifecycle management for operating systems and configuration management. But then you also have technologies like Heat that are providing a topology description for your infrastructure as well as the OpenShift cartridge construct, which provides a, a topology descri description for your application layouts. All right. And even the best part, right? So the best part, I would urge anybody to throw this slide up there from any other organization in the world, completely open source, right? So the coolest thing about our portfolio is we're not the only ones building it, right? We have open source communities for every one of our projects. It's not that we say, our infrastructure as a service is based on OpenStack, and our management is proprietary, or vice versa. We're not trying to say our management is open source and our infrastructure as a service is, is proprietary. It's completely open, right? So every one of these is based on an open source project, whether it's Satellite, which is based on the upstream of the Foreman project, um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform, obviously based on RDO, our, our, um, our, uh, our community distribution, or OpenShift, which has OpenShift origin, community, as well as cloud forms, which we actually announced the open sourcing of this year. So we actually took uh, you know, a $100, $100 million acquisition that we made in 2012 and open sourced the entire code base. And our, you know, we just had the first design summit session on that, and it's really kicking off with a bunch of partners and, and uh, users. So completely open, so you're not really getting uh, innovation from one company. So again, uh, the, I think when you, when you think about this, and it certainly has the, the, the products and the solutions we have here, but the way I would, I would suggest we look at things is where are you on kind of this, the journey of these different architectures? Have you adopted cloud management? Are you at the infrastructure as a service layer? Are you at the platform as a service layer? Are you at XPaaS? And then if you are, kind of what are you doing in your workload space? Have you done discovery against your workloads? Do you know what you have in-house? What's the most requested application that your dev teams use? What are they asking for? What are they developing on? What are they moving towards? Are you, or have you implemented workflow? So have you automated your existing infrastructure? If you haven't, there's probably a huge you know, return on, on, on that alone. And then third, are you developing these patterns for the future, where you're looking at, how do I develop a, a pattern for how to deploy all my virtual machines and instances? Um, how do I develop a pattern for how I'm going to deploy containerized applications? So on and so forth. So again, Red Hat has a broad range of products and offerings for this, but what I would urge you is, Think about, start thinking this way, like have you discovered, have you built a workflow, have you built patterns? All right, so around community involvement. So I mentioned all of our, all of our Red Hat's portfolio is open source. Um, I'm not gonna get into this, but too deep. Let me see, just check, time check. So I don't wanna get into this too deep, but um, you know, we, we have a long and, you know, history of, of open source contribution, right? We, we started contributing pretty quietly actually to OpenStack. Um, Mark McLaughlin, who was on the keynote yesterday, um, was one of our, our first contributors. So he started with Nova and Oslo, I think, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in 2011. So I think that was not Folsom. It was, yeah, Essex, right? So he started in Essex in 2011. 
Um, again, we've been a you know, number one contributor. It's not, it's not to say that being number one contributor is the most important thing. The, the key takeaway is being involved heavily in the, in the open source community is very important. Um, Red Hat's known this from the Linux kernel days where you know, if you need a, a kernel patch, being able to uh, you know, call, the, call the right people and talk to the right people and influence them is, is very important. Um, and we have kind of this, this, this approach to OpenStack where we're fully in, committed to the open source community, right? But we also realize that it's kind of, it's an, it's an unstable community distribution, right? People use it for development. Then we have RDO, which is our, you know, bleeding edge, it's upstream. It's, but what we're doing is we're taking the source, we're packaging it as RPM so people could use it easily. And of course we have enterprise Linux distros here, whether it's CentOS, RHEL, or Fedora. Um, no, no support, six month life cycle, so it's very fast moving. And this is the same thing we did with, with, with Linux, right? We basically looked at Linux and we figured out pretty early on that, you know, a lot of the investment banks and customers that were early adopters of Linux, they loved it because of the innovation, but they hated it because of the maintenance. Um, and so you've been hearing a lot of debate about that uh, in recent weeks about the, uh, the life cycle of OpenStack. And so that's what Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform really addresses. And that's the three year life cycle with all the support and the ecosystem of certifications. So basically all the certified ISVs and IHVs that can run on Red Hat Enterprise Linux can run with Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform. All right, so la last bit here. So just to, um, you know, this was shown to me this morning. So the, uh, the, if you took the actual, if you go out to Stackalytic, Stackalytics, which Red Hat doesn't control the statistics around Stackalytics, um, if you look at the stats, uh, if you actually take the Icehouse release um, and you take the Inovance and Ink Tank acquisitions that Red Hat did, so Ceph and the, the Inovance folks, um, we are actually the, the number one contributor. Again, not that it's uh, important about being number one, but it is important that we're heavily involved and invested. So I'm not going to jump into here. We'll skip over that. But I do want to tell you a couple things. So um, a couple of resources. If you want to find out, you know, if you're ready for OpenStack or learn more about our hybrid cloud offerings, there's the URLs. There's also a limited time offer. I was going to say, uh, I was going to do kind of an infomercial as a joke to it. So there's a, there's a, if you buy your OpenStack certification exam, you get the online learning course for free. So um, definitely take advantage of this if you're interested in OpenStack training. Uh, you can go down to our booth. The first 500 to buy the exam get the related course for free for 90 days. Um, and you can guarantee your seat. The first 10 to register with the promo code, prep for stack, will be guaranteed a spot. Um, so hopefully by the time you guys are watching this on the video, those have already been used. All right. And then uh, a couple things on the additional sessions. Um, we've got a number of different sessions. The authors of the OpenStack design guide is really cool. So Vinny and Steve are putting that on. They've basically written a design guide for OpenStack. So if you want to talk to the guys who are, you know, knee deep and elbow deep in, uh, in OpenStack, that's the way to do it. Um, uh, the Neutron Network Node HA is definitely going to be a great talk. Nick Barsett from Innovance, transforming to OpenStack, really good talk. Um, Chris Wright on the Open, he's uh, Open Daylight, um, the, the lead of Open Daylight at Red Hat, he's giving a, a talk as, as well. And then Mark is doing um, a talk on Oslo messaging. I would say the one last piece too is the Docker, all the OpenStack services that uh, Todd and I are doing, or, or sorry, Brent Holden and I are doing um, tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to give a demo of basically launching all the Docker services, all the OpenStack services using Docker and Kubernetes on something called Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic um, in like two minutes. So basically from no OpenStack to OpenStack in two minutes. It's pretty cool. So um, much more technical than this talk. So, but uh, if you're interested, please, please stop by. Uh, we have a big crew coming. So. Let me, uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any, uh, any questions, and thanks for, thanks for coming. Any questions? No? Quiet crowd? All right. Thank you, guys.